I'm Dan. Alex, come on. Okay, just kidding, guys. Alex is not here today. Let's do a celebration dance. <laughs> this feels so weird, but I'm not joking. Alex is not here today, which you might explain either in a voice message here or next week's episode. I'm not entirely sure. I'm going to put in a voice message from him soon regardless. But in that whole process, requiring him to leave his house two and a half hours before the flight, which he booked two and a half hours before leaving, he didn't bring a microphone. So Alex does not have a microphone, which means this is on air with Dan. It's truly me and you guys today. We're all positive energy. We're all team Gothenburg all the way. This is the Gothenburg Express nonstop out of Gothenburg. <laughs> oh, how the tables have turned. He has got exactly what he wanted. An entire episode without me to roast him, correct him, guide him, remind him that Gothenburg is not a cosmopolitan hub and is not relevant to anyone but himself. And yet here we are with him to be able to run free. God knows what he's going to do in this episode. Listeners, I can only apologize. You know, in all seriousness, I am eager, eagerly awaiting uh, to hear what he has planned. But yeah, I knew my hand luggage felt lighter. I knew that I had forgotten something. And it was only when I was at 41,000 feet, I had that home alone mum moment where I was in deep sleep. And then I awoke to the microphone. And that plus a whole other kind of logistical reasons means that it, it is going to be impossible to, to find the time to join you, Dan, to get this episode out before Wednesday. We spoke about delaying the episode and we thought, you know what, we'll leave you to it. I trust you. I assume this is not an attempted coup. If it is, I'm going to launch on, on air with Alex and it will rival on air with Alex and Dan because, well, you do the math. I mean, I think the listener base, I think we know where their hearts are, right? In all fairness, I am eagerly waiting to hear what you have to tell me about the Lufthansa takeover, to hear about what happened with Virgin Atlantic and much more. And look forward to joining you guys next week. I will hand back over to you with both, I guess, excitement and complete dread and horror. Talk soon. Today. I'm mainly going to be going over Q&A from you guys. There are so many questions that I can answer without Alex, especially pertaining to different airline products. For example, I've flown over 160 airlines, as you might know. So I have, you know, some opinions to share there. I also will be answering, well, not answering, but discussing the whole thing about Lufthansa acquiring ETA Airways. We've discussed it a little bit before on the podcast, actually not even a little bit, a lot. So you can hear our mutual discussion on that. But now it's been officially confirmed by the European Commission that this is allowed to go through for Lufthansa to buy a stake in ETA Airways of Italy. And next year, starting then, they will be allowed to buy the full airline. So let's start talking about this a little bit. What does it mean? And for you as consumers, should you be scared? So you know that Alex and I maybe are not the biggest fans of Lufthansa Group. We feel like they take an airline like Swiss, they take an airline like Brussels Airlines that have a lot of personality and have a lot of things that make them unique. Brussels Airlines was like the third business class product I ever flew. And I was blown away how they had these little touches like giving a full box of Belgian chocolates before landing, which was obviously really nice. I'm not sure if they do that anymore. But it's those kind of things that Lufthansa likes to look at and say, how can we make this as cheap as possible to make as much money as possible and kind of screw our customers over? Lufthansa was once a great airline in our opinion, and now even the board of the airline's opinion, they are not that great anymore. So seeing them swoop in and wanting to acquire a carrier in Italy, this is something they've been trying to do for decades. They actually had an Italian subsidiary I guess about a decade, 15 years ago, Lufthansa Italia, because they're really trying to break into the Italian market even more. Italy is their biggest and most important market in Europe besides Germany, which is kind of crazy. So finally, Lufthansa gets what they want. Obviously, the European Commission, well, supposedly, they were looking at this thinking, how can we reduce the impact on competition, the negative impact on competition? as much as possible. So what have they done? And this I find really interesting to discuss because they 
introduced a few measures that Lufthansa Group and ETA Airways have to take in order for this merger to go through. So there's some normal ones like, for example, encouraging or enabling competitor airlines to launch competing routes. So for example, ETA Airways operates a lot of flights to the US. And once they're a part of Lufthansa Group, that eliminates competition for people who are you know, looking to book either Lufthansa or ETA Airways. Now, the goal is to incorporate ETA Airways into the transatlantic joint venture, which comprises Lufthansa Group, United, and Air Canada, and soon ETA Airways. So all of these airlines, let's say you're flying from Rome to New York, you have an option to fly United or ETA Airways. And until now, they've been competing on price, but starting who knows how soon, they'll be coordinating on price and actually sharing profits, which obviously hurts passengers. So the idea is that some other airline in Europe would need to launch this route, for example, or uh, Rome to Los Angeles to increase competition. That's going to be difficult when you consider that there aren't really any airlines in Europe that are going to say, you know, picture KLM saying, hey, I'll launch a flight from Rome to Los Angeles. It makes no sense. So how's that going to work? That's an outstanding question. Now, there's another thing that is sort of unique in all this that I find especially fascinating. Apparently, Central Europe is a market where ETA Airways has a lot of flights and there's really no competition. Ryanair flies there, but they fly to the other airport, the secondary airport in Rome. So it's not from the main airport, Fum Fumicino, <laughs> something like that. There's also a question in Milan, where Milan Linate, the city airport, the best located airport in Milan, you could say, is really already quite dominated by Lufthansa Group and ETA Airways. So what happens when they become the same company? That's going to really hurt prices and competition. So the EC, the European Commission, has said, guys, you need to enable competitors to launch more flights to Lenate by doing what? By giving up slots. In theory, this is supposed to allow airlines from Central Europe or other markets that ETA serves and there are no competitors on to launch flights to Lenate uh, as easily and quickly as possible. But the catch here, the thing that makes it even more interesting, you know that ETA can connect people to anywhere in Italy through this airport, all their destinations. If they fly from, let's say, Prague, I'm not sure if that's a route, but if they fly from Prague to Milan, they can connect you to anywhere. If Czech Airlines flies you from Prague to Milan, they cannot take you anywhere else in Italy once ETA Airways is a part of Star Alliance and the Lufthansa Group and Joint Venture. So what ETA has to do is they have to allow airlines that are launching these flights from Central Europe to actually code share or be able to sell tickets on their connections throughout Italy, even if they're not currently partners and these airlines are not a part of Lufthansa Group. It will be very interesting to see how that works. I have one more thing to add on the Gothenburg Express, guys. Before we get to q and I have an exciting update because Alex and I often speak positively about Virgin Atlantic, although both of us barely fly them. I was supposed to fly them. You might have heard a few episodes ago. About three weeks ago, my flight was scheduled, or maybe almost a month at this point, but the flight was canceled the morning of departure. So at 8 a.m., I find out my 6 p.m. flight is canceled. I end up choosing Gasp to be, to be rebooked on Delta just because they're so expensive and so difficult to review otherwise that I thought, let's take this chance. So London to New York on Delta the next day. But the crazy thing is I actually chose to be rebooked on Delta. Virgin Atlantic automatically rebooked me on British Airways on a flight that left 20 minutes earlier even in club suites. That's pretty crazy considering the British Airways is their biggest competitor. They didn't even ask. They just automatically rebooked it. I called them and said, are you crazy? Do you think anyone books Virgin Atlantic to fly British Airways? And it gave the agent quite a good laugh. We had, we had a, actually all of Virgin Atlantic's phone agents are hilarious. You could talk to them about anything. Well, sometimes when you're making a booking and like they're doing the formalities or waiting for the system, I literally just have a conversation about anything and it's, it's usually quite fun. So I have an update about that whole situation. After the flight, I submitted a request 
not only for them to cover the costs that I incurred, so a hotel in London, meals in London, which they're supposed to cover according to EU and basically the UK copy of that law, UK 261, which stipulates the different, uh, you know, compensation and uh, costs that they should cover in the event of a delayed or canceled flight. I wasn't sure if they would cover anything because they actually offered to get me to my destination 20 minutes early. So there wasn't a problem there. Yes, they canceled the flight, but they gave me the option and they didn't even make a fuss about it. So they made that so easy, but I thought, hey, I might as well send this in and see if it works. I also greedily thought, hey, let me send in a compensation request because technically they canceled my flight and there was no weather, there was no extraordinary circumstance. So perhaps they will agree and I'll be able to get 520 pounds per person. So 1,040 pounds, what a nice cash in, plus them paying for our meals in the hotel. We stayed at the Sofitel Terminal 5, 200 pounds for a night. So we were we were living life. I knew my travel insurance would cover those costs, but I thought, okay, let's see if Virgin Atlantic will do it as well. Submitted those requests. I am not joking when I tell you that 24 hours later on both these separate requests, I heard back from Virgin Atlantic saying, your request has been approved. Please enter your bank details here. We'll send you the money within 21 days. I received the money a few days ago, so it was about a 10 day wait or so. And now I have the money both covering my costs and 520 pounds per person. They didn't argue. They didn't say a word, even though they did the right thing and tried to get me to my destination earlier than originally scheduled, but not so much earlier that I couldn't make the flight, you know? Instead, I opted to fly the next day and still got compensation. So I have to give a massive kudos to Virgin Atlantic. And it's almost scary comparing how smooth and incredible this process was compared to many other airlines in Europe. I have to also say British Airways is generally quite good with this. But in continental Europe, you look at Lufthansa, they will refuse by any means. And I'm talking about Lufthansa Group. KLM, also famous for refusing for any means. SAS, even worse. I'm not, I don't even know what to say about SAS, but the number of times I've tried to request things and they make up the weirdest stories or scenarios to get out of it. So that's almost what you expect as a frequent traveler, you know, submitting a EU or UK compensation request and getting some of the, you know, the weirdest lie as a response. So for Virgin Atlantic, less than 24 hours after submitting my form when SAS or Lufthansa can take weeks or months to get back to you, tw less than 24 hours, they say you're approved, send it within a third of the time they said it would take without any questions asked. Massive, massive kudos to them. Toto, we ain't in Gothenburg anymore. <laughs> Thanks for hanging in with me there. I hope you learned something interesting. Let's jump right over to Q&A and uh, we'll see if we have some fun questions to answer. So the first question is from a user named Alex. He says, Dan, can you let me out of the basement? I know you took the key. This is our mutual podcast. Oh, okay, never mind. Wait, that's not for the podcast. Uh, okay, another question here is from Khalil. He says, hey, Dan, goes without saying that the podcast is better than ever. Anyway, a question for you and Alex. How do you feel about using individual airlines frequent flyer programs for the added convenience slash incremental benefits such as free Wi-Fi? So he elaborates here. He says, for example, I'm a New York-based flyer and fly Delta for work. I used to be a flying blue loyalist, but after a few rebooking cancellation experiences, I found that life is so much easier if I've used my SkyMiles number, not to mention the free Wi-Fi that Delta now offers on newer aircraft that's consist contingent on using Life Miles. Sky Miles, not Life Miles, very different. Curious to hear your guys' thoughts. Thanks in advance. So sorry, Khalil, you only get to hear my thoughts, but I don't know what Alex would have to say about this anyway, right? No, I'm sure yeah, he would have good insights, but... Anyway, this is an interesting question because a lot of people always ask, what frequent flyer program should I be a member of? Should I be a member of the airline where I live or should it be something abroad? Most people who are not in aviation assume I should just sign up with the airline I always fly with. So if I fly SAS, I fly British Airways, 
those are the airlines whose programs I should use. People who are in the sort of frequent flyer community tend to tell you the opposite thing. In fact, it's much easier to get status with a foreign airline. Like if you're an American airline loyalist, you fly a lot domestically. If you have status with British Airways, it's so much easier to earn that status, first of all. But then you get things like lounge access thanks to your status when flying domestically in the US, which you don't get even with the highest status on American due to how their lounge policies work. So this is a situation where I would say it depends. If you live in a market where you get huge benefits from being a member of that specific program. So like you're saying with Sky Miles, and you also have to look at Sky Team, for example, you don't get very strong elite benefits across different airlines in Sky Team. So having platinum status with Flying Blue is great if you fly Air France KLM a lot, but it isn't as helpful if you fly Delta a lot. You don't get you know, waived, um, well, actually, you always get waived uh, change fees with Delta, but you don't get things like extra legroom seating, Delta Comfort Plus, if you have flying blue status. However, in one world, it's kind of different. Yes, if you have British Airways status, you won't get free upgrades, for example, on American, but you'll get free extra legroom seats on American and several other one world airlines, even though you don't hold status with that airline you're flying. So, one world I would say is a particularly interesting case where sometimes or actually a lot of the time it makes sense to try to get status with a different airline. Perhaps having status with two if you can and going for the the second highest status with American and then having silver status with BA for example. That gets you a good combo because you'll get lounge access when you fly American. After popping into the lounge you can change the number back to your American Airlines number. There's also situations like with Emirates, where unfortunately, if you fly Emirates and you want to get free Wi-Fi, you have to enter your Sky Skywards number, so many Sky dot 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 things, your Skywards number in order to get free Wi-Fi on your booking, so before the flight. Meanwhile, on Qatar Airways, if you want to claim your free one hour of Wi-Fi as a Privilege Club member, you don't have to credit your flight to Privilege Club, you just need to be a member and sign in to claim your free Wi-Fi. So there are so many sort of asterisks here that I don't know exactly what to recommend because it depends on everyone's situation. From an airline loyalty program perspective, of course it makes sense to try to engage people with your own program and use that instead of a competitor's program, especially if they live, if the passenger in question lives in one of your hub cities. So thanks for that question. Another question here from Sean. He says, hey, Dan, big fan of your videos and podcasts starring Alex. LOL. Uh, great start to this question. I know Alex listening to this is going to be <laughs> blood boiling. So, okay, so it's a question for the pod. I'm planning to fly from Seoul to Melbourne early next year. I'm thinking of flying either Cathay Pacific, China Airlines, or Qantas. Nice choices. I'd love to fly Korean or Asiana, but they're a bit out of my budget. I've flown Kathy before and I love it. I know Kathy provides uh, the better service of the three. Mm, I wouldn't necessarily agree. I also want to experience different airlines, he says. I love the A350 and China Airlines operates that out of Melbourne to Taipei. On Qantas, it's the A330, which is more direct since it would be Sydney to Seoul. And Kathy has longer layovers. So basically the question is, out of these three airlines, which should you choose? And I just have to say, for people who live in Australia... Flight prices are crazy, so I don't envy you from that perspective, but I do envy you for having such an ideal selection of airlines to fly when going literally anywhere abroad. Because this choice, what a luxury choice for someone in Europe or the US to have a choice between Qantas, which I find quite good, especially on board, or Cathay and China Airlines, amazing. In my opinion, out of these three, I'd actually go with China Airlines they are, in my opinion, one of the most underrated airlines in the world. So that is my tip, especially since it's a 350. Qantas is not a bad choice either. Cathay is not a bad choice. I would honestly go with what's cheapest and what's most important for your status goals. This question, I think, will help a lot of you get a sort of general reference for what's reasonable to pay for an upgrade. So RS says, hi, Dan, love your podcast with Alex has uh oh he didn't say he loved it sorry i just added that myself he says hi dan your podcast with alex has always been so entertaining and informative i'm enjoying every minute of them 
I'd like to ask, how do you value business class tickets in general? I.e., how do you decide if the ticket's worth spending or not? So this is interesting because I actually posted a reel on this and a lot of people seem to agree. There's a general consensus on how much you should pay for business class over economy or for premium economy over economy based on how long your flight is for it to be a good value. Now, of course, this the the value differs from person to person. If you make millions of dollars a year, I bet you're willing to pay whatever the business class flight is, business class prices. If you make, you know, a reasonable living where you can afford to pay for an upgrade now and then, this is my my rule. So for a premium economy flight, really regardless of the length, I would say it's reasonable to pay between 20 and $40 per hour of flight time to upgrade. So for London to LA, around $400, three to $400 would be reasonable. I don't think you're going to get it lower than that. For London to New York, $250, $250 to $300 is more reasonable. For you know Europe to Dubai, even shorter, $200, even under $200 is quite a reasonable price. When it comes to business, $50 to $75 an hour is my general reference. A lot of people seem to agree with this. So again, for a 10-hour flight to LA, I wouldn't say it's reasonable to pay more than $700 maybe $800 for that flight to upgrade from economy to business. If you're looking at a 17 hour flight, well, then you're looking at a lot, you're looking at, you know, way over a thousand dollars, but it's still reasonable paying $1,500 or $1,300 for, and you know, New York to Singapore, for example, especially on Singapore airlines, that's what you can expect to pay. And then again, if you look for, you know, for example, Abu Dhabi to Paris, which I did uh, last year, the price to upgrade from premium economy to business class was just over $300. That's a six, six and a half hour flight. So basically that's like $50 an hour from premium economy to business. So if you break that down, if you think about economy, that upgrade price would probably be closer to $75 an hour. So still within the reference I find reasonable, but then of course it's up to you, however, however much you value it. I'm just saying it's unlikely you're going to find an upgrade offer for less than that price. When it comes to first class, there's really no correct response. Airlines can charge all types of crazy rates. It depends on the load. It depends on demand, uh, demand and that kind of stuff. So let's see what other questions. There's some I want to discuss with Alex. So I don't know. This is a good last one just because we've kind of discussed this. Hamza uh, asks, when do you think Qatar will start a route to Toronto? Both Emirates and Etihad have flown out of here since almost forever. Saudi is even relaunching their flights here um, since Canada-Saudi relations have eased up and Turkish flies to three cities in Canada. So when will Toronto be graced by the Grey and Burgundy Oryx? Thanks for this question, Hamza. The final one of my solo episode. I'm going to you know, enjoy this moment as much as I can before Alex comes back to pester us next week. So comes out Um, this. I have an unfortunate and sad answer for you. This is unlikely to happen unless there's some sort of diplomatic breakthrough between Canada and Qatar. Canada is extremely restrictive. We've discussed this before on the podcast, extremely restrictive with allowing foreign airlines to operate. If I lived I don't even know if I could live in Canada because of this alone. If I lived in Canada, I'd be going crazy because flight prices are so ridiculously high to and well, mainly from Canada, but also to Canada because the Canadian government restricts restricts competition so much, which helps bolster Air Canada and allows them to charge ridiculous prices. When I was flying from Pittsburgh to Toronto earlier this year, which is a flight under one hour on a regional jet. The lowest price for the coming two months was $400 round trip in economy class. So that goes to show the situation in Canada. So this applies to many airlines, but especially Middle Eastern airlines and even more so Qatar Airways than Emirates because Emirates now has a partnership with Air Canada, which allowed them to increase their slots to Canada, which meant Air Canada launched more flights to Dubai and Emirates 
was allowed to launch flights to, I think they increased the number of frequencies to Toronto and they were able to launch flights to Montreal as well. So Air Canada or Qatar Airways is only able to fly to Montreal in Canada at the moment. They fly once a day. A few years back, if you look just after COVID 2021 22, Air Canada was actually partnering with Qatar Airways to fly from Toronto to Doha. They were operating that flight on behalf of Qatar Airways because Qatar Airways couldn't make it work diplomatically. So until there's some breakthrough there, this is the same reason Qatar Airways has been restricted from expanding in markets like Germany and Australia. Until something new happens, there won't be flights to Toronto, but you better believe that Qatar Airways is desperate to be able to launch flights to Toronto and probably Vancouver as well. So, as you know, just to add context here, because their biggest market is really connecting people to the Indian subcontinent and famously Canada has a lot of people traveling between Canada and the Indian subcontinent. So that is it. Hamza, I hope that answered your question. That's it for my solo episode. Thanks for joining me today on the Gothenburg Express, guys. I hope to see you with Alex next week. Alex, stop. I I'll, I might like you out next week. <laughs> oh, poor guy. Shouldn't have forgotten his microphone. Okay. But we will see you next week on air with Dan and maybe Alex. <laughs> <laughs>